a mafioso's assassination, a usurping monarch, a prophesized empire, and a world war. Today we start down the path of how a community of friendly Minecraft players descended into a drawn out and vicious global conflict. This is the beginning of the Trillium War. It's a sandstorm, a fucking killer sandstorm. All of this history which you're about to see is a true story on the Stoneworks Minecraft server. Here you can be an emperor, a traveling prophet, a pioneering businessman, and much more. Shape the world in your way with your imagination today, only at this IP, play.stoneworks.gg. This is Delatra. She was an important part of Minecraft history. She was a succubus who was born in the empire of Yimu Audal's capital, Urnu Arak, and as a young adult, she was sent to the Western Mesa, where she came to run the rich and influential city-state of Ardat Mosul. She was a powerful noblewoman, a genius banker, and an even better friend. All around Yimu Audal's sphere of influence, she came to know many important people, people who would eventually elect her to be the empire's queen people that would rise in rebellion under her, and one of her best friends who would be driven mad and violent by a goddess of chaos. This is the story of Delatra losing her reigns to her empire, the rise of her authoritarian enemies, and her death in the bathhouses of Ardat Mosul. When you join the world of Rathnir, you'll see that it is very different today than it was in December of 2020. Back then, the first great states had just seen their first crises, as the VIR collapsed under its own weight, and the Empire of Olderash was blasted in the Golden War by the newly ascendant Republic of Bardonia. This left four great powers in Rathnir for us to talk about. The Republic of Bardonia, the Silver Coalition, the Empire of Asharia, and the Empire of Yimu Audal. Delatra became the Empress of Yimu Audal. However, the state at this time was visibly declining. Delatra was forced to fire her only good fighter in the military. There was a group of blood god worshippers illegitimately claiming themselves as the rulers. There was a socialist revolution in the province neighboring the capital, and there was a failed conspiracy by Delatra herself to overthrow the divine emperor of the neighboring Asharians. With international tensions on the rise, and the weight of all this bearing down on Delatra's shoulders, a small and unexpected little crime syndicate would begin to unravel everything. The Krakowski Mafia, as they were called, would go around to small towns and racketeer money from them, threatening them with bandit attacks. They had most recently done this to Delatra's personal friends in neighboring Sirenvir, so she placed a $60,000 bounty on the head of their leader, Mr. Krakowski. She then arranged a meeting with this Mafia boss to discuss ceasing their activity in her region. They met in the city of Azathvir, but as Delatra walked in with her bodyguard, she was met by a low-level grunt who just said, Krakowski sends his regards, and I'll let the rest of the source speak for itself. This murder could not stand that a lonely criminal would dare assassinate the empress of the world's largest and oldest empire. She immediately declared the Krakowskis an enemy of Yimu Audal and sent spies to find their hideout. Later, they returned and showed her that they were operating out of a basement in the city of Lilayanin, the capital of neighboring Asharia. This could have been an awkward development. Recall that Delatra had recently been caught trying to orchestrate a coup of Asharia's divine emperor, player Zika Ost, a coup which she had to pay a humiliating $100,000 indemnity for. But she would not be deterred, for her agents speculated that the Asharian Emperor himself was secretly behind the Mafia and its assassination. She ordered the beginning of Operation Sharpness. Assembling her secret police, they infiltrated Lilianen and paid one of her friends in the city to lead them into Krakowski's secret base. Here they killed the gangster, destroyed his chests, and blew up the base. Soon after, two Asharian warriors showed up in response, Debbie and Atumno, who tried to chase down and kill Delatra, but she and her police escaped the city and made their way back to Urnu Iraq. So Operation Sharpness was a success! The Krakowskis were eliminated, and so the Audaladad partied in her royal court. 
when she received a message from the Divine Emperor of Asharia himself. You come to my city, you steal my property, you bribe one of my citizens, and do you think you are outside my sight? An absent emperor's eyes are the sun and moon, and you still think the sky does not see you? You are a breaker of laws, a raving lunatic, an unstable child, and a falsely crowned empress. By Silene and Solaris, you will make amends under the supreme skies of Asharia and Holy Soleana. Delatra Mozolia, resign from the throne of Yimu Audal right now! So this was a conundrum. To figure out what to do, Delatra sat and received counsel from her friends. The bartender of the Grizzly Bear Pub, Carpicious, the Emperor of Olderash, Whiskey Knight, and the famed map maker and scholar, Athaz the Traveler. She received some differing messages here. Whiskey Knight, whose empire had recently been cut in half through losing a war, advised her, If you care more about the life of Yimu Adol than keeping the crown, do not fall into bloodshed. Asharia and her allies are laying bait for you. Do not take it. Athaz advised her in a historical sense. You've been down this road with Emperor Zika Ost before, yet it turned out differently. You could probably get a compromise and a settlement. Zika Ost claims to be ordained by the Sky Gods, yet he is only human, and an inept one at that. And then, Carpicious advised. My friend, you've seen Yimu Audal grow complacent and antsy under your rule. The peace has given your empire time to wobble and decay. You can restore it now by indulging your people in a little turbulent war. And at this, the others looked at her in disbelief. You actually want her to go to war with Asharia? Yes, Carpicious did. Okay, wait. Yimu Audal is definitely not turbulent because it's peaceful. There's too many competing interests in it. A war would probably just split the people even more and cause unrest. If anything, Zika Ost would get stronger because at least his population buys into the whole divine dictator thing. That's not even to mention that Delatra doesn't even have any good fighters anymore. And Zika Ost definitely does. He could call on his buddies in Bardonia to join in. And Delatra, honestly, you would be screwed. Carp, what's gotten into you? Maybe you've been spending too much time in your bar and it's making you stir crazy? And as they started to talk and bicker a little bit, Delatra thought through these options they gave her, and she decided and told them she would give up the crown for her people. With a heavy heart, she went and she announced her resignation, and designated the player Grey is Yes as the regent. On her way back to her hometown of Ardat Mosul, she undoubtedly pondered what her place in history would be. Yimu Audal was founded by giants before her, and she came in as some foreign queen and led the empire through rebelling provinces, roving blood god bandits, and nearly a catastrophic war with Asharia. Was she enlightened to swallow her pride, trust in the terms that Sika Ost had set, and submit for the sake of her people? Or was she weak and unwilling to delve into violent bloodshed to defend them? When she got home, she went up to her penthouse. It was here that she kept the ancient and enchanted crown of Yimu Audal the symbol of the emperor's imperial power passed down from its legendary founder. But as she searched in its frame above her bed, it was missing. Instead, there hung a mysterious note, saying that the crown's been stolen and there could no longer be a legitimate ruler of the empire. In the casino below, Delatra found her wife, the Velareth of the nation Aulinor, Coffee Cubis. In her penthouse, they had a great argument. She freaked out, accusing her of stealing the crown. They, of course, denied this, and both started screaming. Delatra cried of betrayal and declared them divorced before storming out. It wasn't long before news of the missing imperial crown of Yimu Audal spread around the world, especially to the people that could make great use of this development. The Divine Emperor, Zika Ost, and his military general and deputy, player Debi, traveled to the capital of Yimu Audal. There they snuck many of their allies from Bardonia and the Silver Coalition through the city walls. With all their people in place and the legitimizing crown of Yimu Audal nowhere to be seen, Zika Ost climbed the throne of Yimu Audal and declared himself the new emperor of the state. No longer was there an Asharia or Yimu Audal separated. By the divine grace of Solaris and Silene, these lands would be united under the neo solanian Empire. A crowd from all over the world gathered in Ernuarak to witness this event, 
and a Zika Ost sat on the YA throne, Coffee Cubis herself stepped forward and lavished them with praises and gifts. Outside in the streets of the city, the socialist leader of one of YA's provinces, Aeon Carweather, attacked the Bardonian and Silver Coalition guards, being chased outside and ending up barricaded in a room. A firefight occurred between them, but the usurper's soldiers broke down his barricade and killed him. Another incident occurred when player T2 Snow of the nation Carve broke through the wall above the throne and attempted to murder the usurping emperor from above, but he was killed by the bodyguards before he could complete it. The appointed regent of Yimu Audal, player Grey is Yes, then confronted Zika Ost on the throne, claiming that the throne meant nothing. He called the Asharian emperor a usurper and a fake attendant. The regent said that the imperial mantle was his appointed right and his alone. And so Zika Ost had someone rename a diamond helmet to the Imperial Mantle of Yimu Audal, and he told him to come and get it. And the regent stormed out in anger. Delatra was hearing of this as it happened overseas. Her blood ran cold, and her eyes filled with tears for her nation was attacked at its heart, and she was no longer there to protect it. She locked herself in the healing bathhouses of Ardot Mosul, and ruminating on how she had failed her predecessors and her friends, she drank down a bottle of poison. Her wives, Tizu and Noodles, and her friend Carpicious broke into the room, only to find her struggling in the water. It isn't clear exactly what happened in there, but afterwards the three women carried Delatra outside. Her eyes rolled back from the poison, her body bleeding out from arrow and axe wounds, and her hand clutching her death note. I curse Asharia for what they did. I curse myself for trusting them. I miss the friends I've betrayed, cause I'll never be worthy enough for anyone else or myself. My dear wives, I love you. My dear daughter, Talir, I'm so sorry. I couldn't be a good mother for you. Please throw my corpse in the mesa and let my body be eaten by the jackals of the desert. After all this occurred in Ardot Mosul, the chess pieces of world politics were moving faster than ever. Back in Yemu Audal, the Elder Council met in Ernu Arak, where they bickered for hours over who would be the next emperor. Among them sat the young woman who had previously chased dreams of power and glory only to be resigned as a bartender, who now had blood on her hands with the death of her friend Delatra, and who was actively being driven mad by a dark presence which loomed behind her and whispered in her ear, Player Carpicious. Even in her inexperienced and declining headspace, Carpicious made an ominous yet successful bid for the throne. She believed that Delatra made one foul move in all her reign, and that was trusting the Asharians. Now with her gone, only she could unify the people of Yimu Audal against the usurping menace. Only she could use Zika Ost's megalomania for the Empire's advantage. Only she could navigate this political chaos and bring Yimu Audal out on top with power wrought through blood and entropy. <laughs> In November of 2020, an axis of nations enforced their authoritarian control over an entire Minecraft world. These events would culminate in market massacres, betrayals, possession by a demonic goddess, and an invasion that kicked off the first world war in Minecraft history. However, we need to remember that none of this happened in a vacuum. The world of Rathnir at this time was a geopolitical chess match. So let's take a moment to zoom out 
and look at the progressing situation of the stonework's politics on this timeline. In the middle here, we have the throne's usurpation, Delatra's suicide, and the ascendancy of Empress Carpicius, all in mid-December. On the far end, we have the beginning of a massive world war. And where all this starts, let's rewind to one of the most influential conflicts in Minecraft history, the Golden War. These are spoilers for the video I made on the Golden War, so go check it out if you haven't seen it. The Golden War saw the nation of Bardonia become the single most militaristically capable state in all of Rathnir, beating out the formerly massive empire of Olderash. The Golden War brought together three powers that would eventually form the most powerful alliance in Minecraft history. So let's look over what each of them did and who they were. Asharia was by far the most centralized and radical of the great powers in Rathnir. It was founded as soon as the first players migrated to Rathnir from the old collapsing world of Jagdis, and those migrating players came to dominate the native race of cold hardened humans with big canine teeth called the Nidane. This state was politically united by the autocratic divine emperor Zika Ost, who spread the Solanian pantheon and ruled by way of mandate from the god Solaris. Asharia won the first wars in Rathnir's history, and they established themselves early on as a power player that would fiercely defend its own corner of the world. However, as Asharia grew, it was not alone in its political sphere, as it shared the Sea of Pearls with the empire of Yimu Audal. The proximity and cultural differences here created a friction between the two. Eventually, they would end up in a war where YA sacked Asharia's capital, and thus began a long-standing rivalry. As a consequence, when Yimu Audal backed their ally of Olderash in the Golden War, Asharia sent troops and materials to assist the opposing Bardonians in their defense of Bardonia City. With the uncontested victory of Bardonia and the sack of Olderash's holdings, Asharia had found friends with the strongest and most militarily ascendant state in Rathnir. As this happened though, Yimu Audal grew extensively by settling towns in their desert frontiers, and under their previous emperor, player Harbarter, they ate up more and more of the Sea of Pearl's coast. And on top of this, there were racially Nidane players in Yimu Audal, like the population of the Enos Fie megacity right near the capital who would soon rebel and receive support from Zika Ost under the table. So, the Emperor had a lot of reasons to adopt aggressive expansionism and absorb neutral coastal towns against Yimu Audal. Many in YA would see Asharia as being a bunch of douchebags with religious superiority complexes, but I'm not here to make those kinds of judgments. Tensions arose between the two neighboring powers, and it became clear that Asharia would need allies if it was going to survive in an increasingly coalitioned world. And luckily, with their siding in the Golden War, they knew just the people to work with. Having the most capable fighters in Rathnir, Bardonia had free reign to influence the world's geopolitics for a while, and they would certainly seize this opportunity. As a nation itself, the Republic of Bardonia was led by a group of active players with a strong national identity. Their ancestors were led to this land by the Dandelion Prophets in a generational migration from the Northwest, being told in visions to only stop and settle when they had reached the land of Dandelions. There's more background to the lore here in the video by Whiskey Knight. Here in the land of Bardonia, these flowers would become their guiding spirits, and the place grew as a fishing town that would eventually prove to dominate in combat and national spirit. When the Golden War came, Bardonia received aid from the Empire of Asharia and the Silver Coalition to their north. Many in Bardonia initially did not like Asharia, what with their leader being a megalomaniacal religious nut. However, after the Asharians sent aid, their opinions softened until they created a defensive pact, one that would be kept totally secret from other nations at the behest of Zika Ost. So with the Golden War fought and won, Bardonia, Asharia, and their northern neighbor who also sent aid, the Silver Coalition, had established a loose triangle of relations. Now within Bardonia, the players created a system that was organized like an oligarchic republic, made up of its prominent members. Here we have famous players like Tizu, Back to the Hub, Moi, Zexus, Unicorn Boy, and more. 
You may know some of these players today, as they're either still active in the community, or they've gone down as legends in Minecraft history. They would convene in this black supervillain lair looking tower in the restored castle of Durastarok. And one of their first motions after the Golden War was to work on making Bardonia the economic center of the whole world. In this castle appeared the first mass market for trading materials, and it became wildly successful. The shopkeeper Unicorn Boy would over time prove himself to be something of a leader in the Senate, but this was purely based on his initiative. Uni here would go behind the backs of his fellow senators, and would strike deals with leaders of other countries before consulting anyone else. He would then bring these treaties to the Bardonian Senate after drawing them up and signing them, and the other senators would just be like, oh, uh, okay? And so Uni came to wield a lot of control in Bardonian affairs, simply because he could take that control by being active. And with this, he held secret meetings with the Asharian Emperor, as well as one rising leader from the north. We of course are talking about this massive country up north, founded when the players Julie Jajo and Darkblade T2 went around to the region's smaller kingdoms and expanded another player's already in place economic pacts. It's a bit complicated, but this would be places like Najerajad, the Sand Republic, Boravia, Lemaba, Icarus, and of course, their capital center of Noxnor. Eventually, this economic union became a political and somewhat cultural one, being named after the silver swords with which they defended together from werewolf bandit attacks, as well as the Noxnorians' religious appreciation for the moon's silver glow, the Silver Coalition was born. Now around the time when the SC aided Bardonia in the Golden War, one leader from Najerajad grew in prominence as a spearhead of the nation's diplomacy and politics, Star 6-7. According to all the sources regarding Star's power and influence, it comes down to a couple very easy and simple things that I encourage all success-hungry players of this server to emulate. But not only this, Star was quite a politically savvy player. He saw the power that a fully united North could wield. In Star's words, it was very clear that Bardonia was an uncheckable power. The only way to keep the North safe from them was to win them over with friendships and official pacts. In an alliance like this, the Silver Coalition received two strong allies who naturally buffered 70% of our border. And so, he met with Uni to make this ideal reality come true. During that meeting, Star showed Uni the secret alliance that he had drawn up with Asharia. And Uni said, Wait, you're allied with Asharia? Yes, secretly. I'm secretly allied with Asharia. Cue the pog face. Something was forming here. Something big. Something beautiful. Something that would bring power to the north. So back in his home city of Najerajad, Star drew up a treaty to bind Bardonia, Asharia, and the Silver Coalition into an unstoppable force. And in a secret meeting between these three major world leaders, the North became unified into the Trillium Alliance. In the timeline of world politics, Trillium was formed right as Delatra came to the throne of Yimu Audal. Now, one of the problems that these super alliances have most of the time is that they have nothing to do with each other until someone attacks them. But that wasn't Trillium. Trillium was not reactionary. They already had enemies, and they already had plans. One of the major things in their crosshairs was an increasing problem that seemed to affect everyone in Rathnir. Bandits. 
As Yimu Aodal seemed to start destabilizing under Delatra's reign, bandits would set up shop there, and they'd roam Rathnir, plundering and terrorizing other countries before storing all their loot in their bases within Ya's borders. Right near Asharia's border lay one of these bandit strongholds, a castle called the Last Bastion, home to a famous bandit group, the Pillagers. The pillagers attacked and burned down three of Asharia's northern towns, and they supposedly tried to threaten and murder some Vardonian citizens. The instability wrought by Delatra's reign proved a threat to the members of Trillium, and perhaps world peace at large. Although, side note, in the sake of fairness, there was also some of that Gablusi Bandosi coming out of Bardankia. You know what I mean. Like and subscribe to Stoneworks for Gablusi Bandosi. Out of these circumstances arose the three main objectives for the members of Trillium that I don't think they explicitly planned, but they did act towards. One, they needed to take out the bandits themselves. Two, they needed to have Yimu Aodal stabilized with a Trillium-friendly leader. Three, in order for that to happen, they needed to undercut the legitimacy of Delatra's regime. So, in the next few days, the members made a series of moves against banditry and its home in Yimu Aodal. A delegation from Trillium, consisting of five Bardonian senators, Star 6-7 from the Silver Coalition, and Zika Ost and Debbie from Asharia, met with the founder and elder council member of Yimu Aodal, Player's Story Studio. They told him that they wanted one of their boys in YA to be appointed regent to Delatra. The player, Grey, is yes. Story Studio told them, We need to vote for a new region, it'll take a bit of time. To which the Bardonian said, No it won't. It'll happen now. And it will be Grey. Story Studio got in contact with his people, and that night, Grey as Yes was appointed regent. And good timing too, cause Delatra just got banned for some shady gambling shit she was doing. People, we still have strict rules on this server. Now for Trillium. When Grey as Yes hopefully became the official leader of Yimu Aodal, he would clamp down on the bandits hiding in his nation, and he would be agreeable to the Alliance's aspirations. After that, Asharia and Bardonia spearheaded a direct assault on the pillager's stronghold in Yimu Aodal. Trillium got some YA soldiers to help attack the Last Bastion and clear its criminal bandits, and so together they marched down onto the stronghold. As Dex OG and Viewed heard of this, they placed down stacks of TNT, and they blew the fortress apart from within. Dex OG would be found standing on the walls of his burning castle, shouting, Long live the last bastion! Forever free of the toxic Killium tryhards! Trillium forces surrounded the bastion, with the bandits firing down upon them from the towers. And slowly, by building overhead cover, they were able to tunnel their way up into the ruined tower heads, finally slaying the bandits and occupying the tower for over 90 minutes. But as this went down, player The Real J2, who was both a bandit and a former military general of Yimu Aodal, snuck into Bardonia and stole a whole bunker's worth of gear. The Battle of the Last Bastion itself was certainly won by Trillium, but Bardonia was left bitter with this theft. And lastly, Zika Ost picked up a rising gang working around the region. He gave them sanctuary and funding, promised them government titles and newly acquired territories, and the Emperor orchestrated with its leader, one Mr. Krakowski. And this, my dear viewer, is where we run into Delatra's story. Assassination, covert operations, declarations, usurpations, with the crown of Yimu Aodal missing, Zika Ost took an opportunity to step in and declare control of Yimu Aodal for himself. The rest of Trillium had been planning for Grey as Yes to eventually ascend to the throne and become tighter with Asharia then. So this initiation came as quite a surprise, but they rolled with it. Skip the step of Grey's ascension and manually bring Yimu Aodal under their control. It was here that the world of Wrath near knew. Trillium and the world had begun an inevitable descent that could only end in war. Zika Ost's simple act of sitting on Yemu Aodal's throne was the spark that set off a powder keg in world politics. Deep political fractures suddenly erupted, a myriad of small nations declared themselves supporting either side, and webs of super alliances were spun out into every corner of Rathnir. 
But even in this, Trillium's own territories saw violent instability. On the Asharian Isle of Tessel, the newly formed Order of Aurora rebelled against the Emperor for his sinful power grabbing, and the old bandit viewed, used this opportunity to go and slaughter them. The Aurorans then fled to Old Arash, and they established the Kingdom of Aurora. With this taken care of, Bardonia further asserted itself on the world stage. There was a Walmart supermarket that had become a popular trade hub in the southern continent of Sorgliste, one that competed with Unicorn Boy's marketplace in Durastarok. So there they sent several Bardonian soldiers, who drew their swords and slaughtered the shoppers and workers there. In a last-ditch effort, the shopkeeper, player Skavenish, challenged the fiercest Bardonian warrior to an honorable duel. Player back to the hub. Just like that, Walmart was closed. But this is not where the interventions of Bardonia ended. You see, at this time, Emperor Zika Ost had published a list of the Alliance's prescripted enemies, those who he accused of terrorism and disturbing the peace, who would immediately be executed if found in any Trillium territories. One of the leaders on this list, a Hewittkin noble named Jane the Bane, responded by joining and leading an insurrectionist movement, one which worked to take refugees from Trillium, isolate Bardonia from the Silver Coalition's treaties, liberate Ernu Arak from Asharia, and eventually assassinate Emperor Zika Ost. But while Bardonia was investigating some stolen war materials, they discovered Jane's insurgency, and over stolen property and a conspiracy, they came to her home city of Tlahadl, and they occupied the streets and demanded her arrest. Once she saw this, she took a few guards, and she barricaded herself in the central temple of the city. The Huitkin leaders, Tlatawani, King Zilorm, and the Kiwakoat, Infinic, met with them. But the Bardonians were obstinate. Bring us Jane, or this city is ours. The scope of this was lost on no one, for Hewitka was an ally of Yimu Audal and many other nations, so here Bardonia was threatening a world war over this single rebel. Zilorm and Infinix stood between them and the temple. They said there was no conspiracy. Nothing had happened for Hewitka to betray one of their own. So Moy used his town claim, and he declared a war on the city of Tlahadl. The clock was now ticking, for in 24 hours, Bardonia would be able to invade, pillage, and raise the city. But the Tlatoani and Kiwakoat tried to cool things down. All right, all right, they said. They could bring Jane to trial. They'd meet in Durastarok, and they'd have a third-party judge, player Luke D. of Vrelea. Jane told Infinic to bring her there, but she was denied because she would just inflame things. At the trial, in the courtroom, the Bardonians lawyered against the Hewitkin Council, King Zilorm, Vicket, and Redfire Rex, as they demanded that the Hewitkin government apologize to Bardonia and denounce and exile Jane. The negotiations and arguments dragged on for hours and got heated. Jane was sitting there, besieged in the temple, and building fortifications for the imminent war, and she was begging her allies to bring reinforcements and hold the city from the Bardonian tyrants. The rest of the world braced itself. Was this the moment that Trillium unleashed and came for them all? As Jane was seen behind her walls with bow in hand, and the Bardonians set up defensive positions around the temple, the three Hewitkins pulled through, and they got a favorable settlement in the trial, only having to publicly apologize and humiliate themselves a bit to the Bardonians. Jane, though, was incensed at this. She had done nothing wrong, nothing for the Hewitkins to apologize for. Inside the temple, she launched into a tirade, denouncing her leaders as cowards and traitors. And so, feeling betrayed by her own government, she slipped through a hole in the Bardonian siege, and she fled to the nation of Carve. For five hours, Rathnir had stood on the brink of total war because of some rambunctious noble and Bardonia's belligerent response. But the time of Moy's war came and went without any struggle, and in the end, Trillium had gotten what they wanted. 
With Bardonia's influence creeping across Rathnir, the consolidation of power crept into the Silver Coalition, culminating in the New Year's Revolution. Star 6-7 witnessed Trillium become the dominating global hegemon from his halls in Najerajad, but he found his nation was unnecessarily meek and unrecognized on the world stage, so he conspired with the other kings of the coalition to usurp the bickering lords of the nation's Naxnorian heartland. On New Year's Day, he rallied his allies and armies together, and they marched into the city of Sovdal and shot flaming arrows into the palace walls of King Darkblade T2. Standing above the crowd and holding an ancient silver sword over his head, Star 6-7 declared himself as the first High Silver King, with the Silver Coalition dissolved and reorganized into the Sterling Crownlands. And there was thunderous applause. Star addressed the crowd, Tonight, there is one true nation of the North, for any challenges to our ideal union will be swiftly met by the Silver Sword. Look now as the gods have come to guide us, Afton, Roris, and Luna, for the full moon rises in the east. This shall be our year, the beginning of a glorious new era for all Rathnir. The noble houses of Noxnor watched from within their homes. Their council voted to play it slowly and carefully while Star's revolution filled the city. And so to his face, they accepted the revolution and they hailed him as High King. But behind their eyes, there was a bloodthirsty fire, hungry for vengeance. In a desert frontier town of Yimu Audal, the Elder Council and newly elected Empress Carpicius met to make sense of their bleak situation. They pored over maps and argued about their next steps to hold off their ever-strengthening enemies. Some proposed border fortifications, others to march and liberate the capital of Ernu Iraq. But Carpicius drew a long arrow around Asharia, through Bardonia and into the north. She explained, Audalite, Trillium lives in authoritarianism and breeds a new dominating order, so we bring chaos to them and they'll collapse under their own weight. This sparked a heated debate, for such a campaign would be costly, risky, and unpredictable. What would they do when confronted with the massive armies of Asharia and Bardonia? Just then arrived Darkblade T2 and Julie Jajo, who told the Council of the New Year's Revolution, the Sterling Crowned Lands, and the coming revolt of the Noxnorians, where they planned to get the new leadership drunk at a party and break through the walls to butcher them like sheep. Carpicious smiled and said to her council, Seems like the fire's already started, and she pledged troops to assist in the Noxnorian revolt. She then addressed her council, who held an uneasy air about all this going down. Everyone, the war is here. My chief diplomat, do your duty and call the allied banners of the lesser nations. My council members, do your duty and follow me, who you have chosen to lead you in these darkest times. I, for my part, will perform my duty to destroy our enemies and bring the light of God back to her world. That's what you wanted? <laughs> and you'll help when they come for us, right? So they rallied an army from the desert towns of Yimu Audal and Carpicius declared total war on Asharia, Bardonia, and the Sterling Crowned Lands. And under the cover of night, they marched east to Asharia and plunged Rathnir into world war. It's a sandstorm, a fucking killer sandstorm. I up the damn arm and found someone to blame. The Empress marched her army across the border, launching this Minecraft world into a world war full of tactical battles, civil wars, and betrayal. Civilizations will collapse, thousands will die, and everything will play right into the hands of an evil goddess of chaos. In the spruce forests, Carpicius' army spotted in the distance the Asharian border fort, Castrum Silvari, and its neighboring village of Kahuarn. 
she ordered her army to build up a base on the hill here, and they spent all night constructing a little traditional fortress. The Asharian garrison spotted the Yimu Audal resistance army, and so they sent for their emperor and prepared for battle. After a long night, Empress Carpicius sent a squad of players out to sneak around the Asharian castle, so they came up alongside the mountain and rained arrow fire onto the garrison. But the Asharian Emperor, player Zika Ost, just arrived and he took command. He sent the legendary fighters Boji Joy and Debbie down to exterminate them. They slowly ascended the mountain, taking cover and shooting flaming arrows behind piles of gravel. They met the resistance fighters and launched into a sword fight, killing the squad of soldiers and throwing one of them off of a cliff. With their right flank protected, Zika Ost sent the bandit warriors Viewed and Dexo G down into the mines of Kok Warren, and they emerged on the other side, killing a warrior along the river before she could alert the YA fort. Viewed and Dex drew heavy arrow fire from the tall walls above, but just then more of their warriors emerged from the forest and started tunneling up into the YA fort. The resistance fighters heard this, and three warriors jumped down into a vicious melee, but it was too late. The Asharians broke through and ascended into the fortress, as Empress Carpicia stood on the walls, distracted and shooting at the diversion below. A bloodbath commenced behind her. In the tight walls of the YA fort, the Asharians cut down the resistance army's warriors, and they climbed the tower and destroyed their spawn beds. Empress Carpicia slipped into her chambers, but Zika Ost burst in, flanked by his warriors. He lunged at her and shouted, DIE MAD EMPRESS! She managed to escape out the door with her life, but they broke her bed, looted her vault, and fully took over the fort. The Battle of Kahuarn was a major success for Asharia. Even if all they did was defend their borders from a small resistance army, it totally repelled Carpicius's insane plan to rampage across Asharia. As the Empress fled back into occupied Yimu Audal, her divine benefactor spoke into her ear. You are not upholding our deal. You caused mayhem, and I let you rule the world. You On the other side of Yimu Audal, the Bardonians received word of Empress Carp's invasion of their Asharian allies, and so they crossed the sea and invaded into the town of Gebel. They took over the town, but they were harassed by a nearby defensive YA garrison. So they constructed a fort across the valley from them, like a lighthouse with their beds at the very top. So if any enemies tried to climb or pillar up to their room full of respawn beds, they'd be easily shot down. The Bardonian invaders demanded the YA garrison surrender, but they refused when Empress Carpicius arrived with a fresh squad of warriors from their closest allies. The world's greatest military force lay at their doorstep across the valley in the lighthouse, so the defenders were very anxious and unsure. Carpicius then launched into a speech to reassure everyone around her. Everyone, those guys across the valley call me a mad empress. They say that I've started a mad war that we have no hope of winning. And maybe they're right. I am mad, because they've sat on my empire's throne. They've suppressed and killed my people and occupied my lands. And they know that my country is just the first domino. Your kings, your cities, your farms and villages will all be burnt down and molded into their totalitarian armies. I attacked Trillium not just to scatter our enemy and set them ablaze. I attacked because I'm mad. We have no alliance, no coalition, no tactics, no negotiations, and no questions asked. But I am mad because we can't afford to lose, but for some reason we can't hope to win. So get mad and show them! Unicorn Boy and his Bardonians heard this yelling from across the valley. Out of fear that this would draw more allied reinforcements, he ordered them to charge forward and assault the YA garrison. The energized defenders saw them coming and gathered in the fort's two main towers. They rained fiery arrows as they approached, but the Bardonian shields held firm. They slowly drove up through the lava and the bush defenses and methodically broke through the outer wall. They built steps up into the tower and slaughtered the defenders on the steps until they reached the top and looted it. The defender Green Toss led a diversion that dragged a squad of Bardonians on a chase outside the tower, but he was killed, and they marched up to the second tower, massacring their way to the top. The remaining defenders retreated up into the platform where their beds were held. They watched in despair as the Bardonians pillared up to finish them off. And from her platform, Entropy grabbed hold of Carpicius, and in a psychotic panic, she hurled herself off the platform over and over again. 
Carp's life flashed before her eyes. The simple times. Serving at the Grizzly Bear Pub in the world center, hosting dance parties and negotiations, all the friends that she'd made from around the world. But then the shrine, the voices, when entropy attached to her. When she started lashing out, walking into random towns and picking fights she knew she'd lose. Starting a cult around herself to rule the world and burn it down. Her deal with the chaotic devil. Entropy's hand making her empress. The world war she started, the lives lost just to entertain her. This crazy thing that attached to her started this whole mess. But was there anything left of her that would finish it? While Carp was out cold, the world had learned of her words before the Battle of Gebel, and many nations pledged their troops to the defense of Yimu Audal. But up north, in the Trillium allied Sterling Crownlands, a rebellion against its new dictatorial High King was about to boil over. The old Noxist lords, who previously had their power taken away from them, hatched a plan. They'd throw a party under the guise of inviting Carpicius for potential surrendering peace talks. Once everyone was tipsy and distracted, Carp's bodyguards would come in, the Noxist lords would rise up, and together they'd murder the dictator and his supporters. And so, today was the day. High King Star 67 sat on a platform with his people, and Carpicius showed up late into the party, not fully healed from her injuries. The dictatorial High King greeted her warmly, but Carp immediately pointed and accused him of being a tyrannical dictator, putting on her armor and drawing her sword. Star was amused by this, and he debated her over where his power came from. Star said that he believed in his nation's unity and everlasting strength. He dropped the crown on the ground in front of her and said, It is not the crown that unifies the people. It is the rightful king who leads them. But when Carpicius picked up the crown, the Noxists sprang into action. They stabbed the others on the stage, and the whole place erupted into confused fighting. Blood sprayed onto the wooden floor, and the player Kirwirion drew his sword and sank it through Star 67's neck. The fight led outside where Carp's bodyguards were stationed, and many slew each other on the grass. At the end of it all, many lay dead on the ground. Carp's elite guard was decimated, and the butchered High King of the Sterling Crownlands lay flat in his own blood. Right then and there, the Noxists crowned one of their own, Dark Blade T2, as the new High King. The new king declared the Sterling Crownlands fully allied with Yimu Audal and enemies of Bardonia and Asharia. And just like that, the nation was turned. But outside, a group of Star 67's old guard had survived, and they fled through the wilderness and into the borders of Bardonia. A great storm started to downpour. And in exile here, they regrouped and plotted revenge on the rebelling Noxist lords. The coup against Star 67 came as a shock to the rest of Trillium. So Unicorn Boy of Bardonia, Zika Ost of Asharia, and the recently exiled Kingsguard met together to take stock of their situation. The Sterling Crownlands was the diplomatic heart that kept Bardonia and Asharia working together. But they weren't a military threat, especially now that many of their warriors were killed in the coup. But Carpicius remained a threat to their south. She and her ministers had started amassing a huge global coalition to her side, and the longer they waited, the larger her force would get. Altogether, she'd have a sizable number of elite fighters, but mostly a giant mob of angry peasants. That meant, if they defeated one of her armies in the field, another would pop up right away. But they crafted an idea. This whole thing was started around the throne of Yimu Audal and the city of Urnu Arak, which the Asharians now occupied. What if Zika Ost withdrew the Asharian garrison and allowed Karp and her coalition to occupy it once again? Then they'd collapse in on her and take the city by force. Its lack of walls and narrow streets were perfect for funneling the coalition's unwieldy army to the slaughter. This would strike a painfully symbolic, demoralizing blow to the whole coalition, 
and since every elite fighter in the world would be here and struck down in this battle, they could launch out afterwards and conquer the whole world with no resistance. Rathnir would become the domain of the Trillium Alliance, and the next era would be defined by them, and them alone. And so, they agreed. The Asharians withdrew most of their garrison and mustered at Kakwarn. The Bardonians mustered at their victorious place in Gebel, and the exiled Kingsguard of the Sterling Crownlands infiltrated Karp's coalition by pledging loyalty to the new usurping king. But Karp's camp was preparing too. Her army was mostly untrained and ill-prepared, so when she saw that the Asharians were pulling out of Ernu Arak, she hesitated to march on it and claim it for herself. So instead, she marched around it and began construction on a massive coalition fort right in front of it. But just like that, her march triggered the Trillium armies to come and surround her position. Carpicius received the news of this while walking in the empty streets of Ernu Arak, and so she conferred with the goddess Entropy. This is all very exciting. You said you would help me and my people. What are you doing? I said I would make you rule the world. Yes, and I am the ruling empress of Yimu Auda. I said nothing of Yimu Auda. Look into the future with me, Carpatius. Yimu Auda is about to be destroyed. The armies of your coalition members annihilated. Trillium will be restored and take over the world. But quickly, they will fall against each other and launch into an even more grand war of the world. All will burn. Every leader will die and its windswept ashes will be ruled by you. All you have to do is keep your elite fighters defending your forsaken base. Let Trillium overrun you and kill every warrior you have. You just flee with your life. See, Carpicious? Haven't I made things so easy for you? The Coalition set up their base. Fields of barriers and landmines, with low walls and tents full of supplies. Above it was a grand labyrinth that would hide the location of their respawn beds from the Trillium invaders. But across the desert, Trillium set up a big, ugly, looming tower with supply platforms of trap doors and glass walkways. Carp ordered the desert between them blown up into a trench to slow their advance. And so, Carpicious waited, flanked by her remaining guards from Yimu Audal, the elite warriors of the entire World Coalition, and the old Kingsguard of the Sterling Crownlands. The volunteer fighters stood on the walls, ready with bows and hands for the fight of their lives. As the sun set, Carpicious watched as the armies of Trillium approached. Their advance echoed the words of Entropy in her mind. But she snapped out of it and commanded the elite troops around her. Go! Get out of here! Take squads and attack their tower! Win or survive! You will beat Trillium another day! Win now or retreat to your kingdoms! And so she grabbed her axe and jumped down from the walls. She defiantly marched onto the battlefield in front of the charging army and she dove into the fray. It's a sandstorm, a fucking killer sandstorm. I up the damn home and found someone to blame on. I pop out the bed with the can drawn. This a sandstorm, a fucking killer sandstorm. Everybody wonder who we be and where we from. No activities, we under sun. I brought the dump of gun. A fucking sandstorm, a fucking killer sandstorm Shooter, but y'all built the hooters That's how y'all maneuver with my Ruger All right, Peter Ruger Bullets going through your whole cleaver I'm not lying either Feeling like I need to rip myself with any features Give or take, I will do neither I'm a Don, I step, I step, I draw, you draw Don't be confused, I never lose And this is proof that it's a motherfucking, motherfucking sandstorm it's a sandstorm, a fucking killer sandstorm This is how the Battle of Ernu Arak unfolded. 
Bardonia sent its main army with Asharian reinforcements to hook around the battlefield and directly assault the Coalition base. Carpitia sent out small squads of the Coalition's elite fighters to avoid the main armies and attempt to sneak up directly into the tower and destroy the Trillium beds and resources. Carpitia met the horde on the battlefield, but was beaten by the warriors back to the hub, Woe, and Call Me Reels, who dragged her off the battlefield as their bloodied prisoner. The Bardonians then fought a thick battle in the barricades and outer walls. The Coalition fired down on them and held them back for several minutes, but eventually they broke and snuck through. A bloody, chaotic showdown unfolded in the Coalition base, where the player masses descended upon the elite Trillium army. But as this raged on the ground, the exiled King's Guard of the Sterling Crownlands climbed into the labyrinth above, and in the name of their fallen leader, Star 67, they betrayed the Coalition and they destroyed the respawn beds. The elite coalition troops were spotted by the Asharians on the platforms. They were shot down and their stealth attacks were thwarted. After trying and failing to break down the Trillium defenses, they followed Carp's orders, and they retreated back to their homelands to reorganize and defend their homes. Seeing the unorganized counterattack, Trillium sent a second, smaller army to assault the coalition base. The bloodbath raged for hours, but in the end, the Bardonian warrior back to the hub stood tall and declared, We have captured the main base! And the soldiers of Trillium cheered yeah! in victory. Right after the battle, the Bardonian warriors brought one of their own, Tizu, to the throne room of Yimu Eldal. They shot the seat with flaming arrows, and much to the dismay of the already usurping Emperor Zika Ost, they proclaimed her the new, competing Empress of Yimu Eldal. This was the Battle of Ernu Arak. <clears throat> Carpitious of the Grizzly Bear Pub, false claimant of the territory of Yimu Audal, for the crimes of grand insurrection, high treason to the Solean throne, conspiracy with enemies of the state, and interfering with arrangement of the Trillium Alliance. You are hereby sentenced under the almighty skies of Solaris and Silene to death. May it be known that so this was it. Her exploits to sow chaos, climb the ladders of power, and rule the world, all crashing to an end. Now there was no entropy to help her, no throne to raise her up, and no escape from the consequences of her ambitions. I ask you now, do you have any final words? You have no idea what I've done for you. We absolutely know. You gave us the keys to the castle. Go! This was the end of the Trillium War, the first world war of Rathnir's history. In the end, the Sterling Crown Land saw its king Darkblade T2 killed in the battle for Ernu Arak, and he was succeeded by his ally Juli Jajo. Juli Jajo successfully repaired his nation's conflicting factions, and he led the United Crownlands in peace for the rest of his days. Bardonia rode high on its victory, claiming the heartland territory of Yimu Audal, and announcing that it would launch a world conquest against the entire world. Arsharia, in turn, showed itself as the defender against Bardonia's aggression, and so many small and fearful vassals around them joined Asharia's ranks, leading to the zenith of the massive First Solean Empire. But the Bardonian conquest was relatively short-lived and localized. They could not steamroll the world as Entropy predicted, and the two superpowers only had a few minor proxy wars and terrorist attacks at the height of their empires and so there was no apocalyptic war of chaos. Instead, Bardonia was bogged down in minor wars and international controversy with the former member nations of the Coalition, for the Coalition's elite soldiers survived the Battle of Ernu Arak. Those who Carpitius ordered to escape and fight another day regrouped and trained their militaries so they could fight off the Bardonians in a slow, grueling effort. But it worked. The Mad Empress had plunged the world into war, but in the end, she spared everyone from the chaotic wrath of entropy. For now, 
If you want to see Entropy's revenge as she tried to create her second apocalypse, check out my friend Red Fire Rex's videos right here. If you want to join this server and play out this same kind of story for yourself, join us at the server IP play.stoneworks.gg. Join a town, make some friends, rise through the ranks, and make epic history for yourself. Thanks for watching.